filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Okay, what would you like me to say next? <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It's not, okay, so I need to put it. Hello, hello? Okay, so what was I not doing? Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? How's this? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. All right. So you can just um, keep this off. Okay, yeah, please. <laughs> yes, brothers. And I'm not the prophet. I'm talking about 
Welcome to the 12th anniversary of Union Theological Seminary's Trailblazers celebration. We are excited to continue the legacy of honoring the ministerial work of Union's black alumni and acknowledging their commitment to social justice. We recognize that the African American scholars who have passed through Union's doors inspire excellence in many. They are blazing trails and changing the world. Thus, we appropriately selected as this year's theme, Transformation, Yes We Do. So as we gather this morning, please stand if you're able, and in celebration of these bold and prophetic voices of the church, the academy, and the world, please join me in responding to the following questions with Yes We Do. Do you use your gifts and talents to build a transformed world characterized by justice and equity for all? Yes, yes, yes we, we do. Do you work hard to join the ranks of Union's alums who are making a difference on this planet? Yes, yes we do. Do you continue to strive to discover and engage your own theological voice? Yes, yes we do. Do you uplift, lovingly challenge, and support fellow and future trailblazers that walk with you on your journey? Yes, yes, yes we do. Do you live 
as the Sankofa symbol that we've adopted for this celebration suggests, with a dedication to taking from the past what is good and bringing it into the present in order to make positive progress. Yes, yes we do. Ashe. Oh God, this afternoon in this atmosphere of Trailblazers Chapel, I offer just a few words of prayer. With my eyes wide open to the difference, my eyes wide open to what is here and what is not here. Oh Lord, I come knowing that there are places within me that need sound. There are places in me still entombed and thinking about yesterday. But there are things within me that are also thinking about tomorrow. But as I open my heart, as we come here knowing that each of us has some room inside of us, may we be filled that in our gaining, we may give. And in our hearing and our understanding, may we learn how to share. Oh God, this afternoon, eyes open to what is and what is not. I am grateful for the space inside to gain and to give. Let us give thanks. Can you all stand with me as you are able? How many of you all know that we serve a great God? It didn't sound like you all knew that. How many of you all know that we serve a great God? Yeah. Amen. So I ask that you lift your voice with me in song. And the lyrics are on your program. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. No one like you Into the darkness you shine You open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you There's no one like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Our God, let's say it again, sounds good. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Our God, and if our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? Then what could stand against? Then what can stand against? We're going to go back to the chorus. Our God is greater. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power. Our God. Our God. We are excited this afternoon as part of the 2016 Trailblazer celebration to welcome once again to James Chapel and to the classrooms of Union Theological Seminary, none other than electrifying preacher pastor, world-renowned gospel recording artist, highly sought-after religious educator, 
author, and social justice advocate, Bishop Yvette Flunder. There is a brief bio printed in your program, but I do want to expand and brag on her a little bit since she's here. Bishop Flunder is a third generation preacher with roots in the Church of God and Christ. She is ordained in the United Church of Christ, and in 2003, she was appointed presiding bishop of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, a multi-denominational coalition of over 56 churches and faith-based organizations from all over the world. She also pastors City of Refuge United Church of Christ. Bishop Flunder's commitment to the church and to God's people extends from the pulpit to the classroom at such universities as her alma mater, Pacific School of Religion, Duke, Yale, and Drew University, to name a few, and includes active leadership in national social justice organizations, such as the Religious Council of the Human Rights Campaign and the National Black Justice Coalition. Bishop Flunder is also the author of Where the Edge Gathers, a theology of homiletical, homiletic radical inclusion, published by Pilgrim Press, Union Theological Seminary. Get ready. I don't know about you, but if you came for a word today like I did, a prophetic word delivered with power and authority, then you will not be disappointed. After the word in motion ministered by Reverend Melvin Britton Miller, the next voice you will hear will be that of none other than Bishop Yvette Flunder. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall.
Good morning. It's a wonderful joy to be back at Union. I was hoping that this time I was not responsible for bringing snow. I've been accused of that time and again when I come this way. I felt so comfortable, so at home, and almost a sense of respite when I got here from the many things that I had to shut down to get here. And what a joy it is to see all of you. The other miracle is that I was told in my briefing that I am to spend about 12 to 15 minutes with you in preaching. Now, I am a Pentecostal, <laughs> and as such, we don't know a great deal about time. God has to help us. You know Pentecostals how we are. So I'll expect someone to give me the look when the appropriate time has come. <laughs> kind of give me that look, you know the look that says that we are. It's with joy that I want to share with you what has been and continues to be the theme for us for 2016-17 in the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries. I'm glad to see some of my fellowship folks that are here and others that are students here at Union who I have been out there in the justice trenches with doing work, the faculty here, the leadership, administrative leadership here. These are folks I know. Good to have Pastor Vanessa Brown here with us today, Rivers of Living Water, who have been in the news here of late with regard to the great possibility and my prayer probability of shifting what has been a bastion of hatred for the LGBT community, turning it into a place of hope. And I am praying for her, continue to support her. The sound of Pentecost. I am, as I said, a Pentecostal who is re-imaging, reconnecting, reaffirming my Pentecostal roots. When I got engaged in the work of seminary, one of the first things folk told me is, don't tell people that you're Pentecostal because they'll diminish you. There's a certain concern, there's a pejorative assumption about you Pentecostals, right? The teaching that we received when I was coming along was that we had to have the Holy Ghost. Now, it was a bit of a conundrum because we were told that the Holy Ghost was necessary to get eternal life. Holy Ghost was necessary to live right, to live holy. Then they told us that you have to live holy to get it, <laughs> which was confusing. We also had the Holy Ghost watchers. The Holy Ghost watchers were the people who stood over you while you were seeking to receive the Holy Ghost. Somebody know what I'm talking about. And they were the ones who determined whether the authentic thing had happened. If you acted like you got it and you really hadn't gotten it, they would say, now go home come back another night to another terrorist service to receive the Holy Ghost and make sure you live right. Do no sin, then come back and you receive the Holy Ghost. But you got to get the Holy Ghost before you can really live right. I was confused, I want you to know that. So it begs the question, now that I'm revisiting this conversation about the Holy Ghost, someone asked me why this is not Pentecost season. And I said to them, I said, I feel moved in this area because, first of all, I think it is important for us to reclaim those things that have value. One of the things that's very important as we evolve theologically is that we not throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater. There are some things that I learned in the Pentecostal church on my knees that I want back again. And I've decided to go on a quest to answer the question, what was the purpose and what happened in Acts 2 and 4? So I want to share a few things with you today that I hope will bless you. The first thing that came to my mind as I was studying this passage is that the command for them to go, for the disciples to go to Jerusalem, to the upstairs apartment that apparently they had a bit of a lease on because they went there from time to time. <laughs> The command for them to go from Jesus in our reading of the text was to wait until the power of the Holy Spirit would come. To wait. To go to Jerusalem and wait. I suspect 
I posit that the reason that they were told to go to Jerusalem was to get them together in one place for one purpose, one call. And let me say to you that this is still the greatest challenge of religion. The absence of unity is a critical problem that exists in the conversation of religion. In other words, before the Holy Spirit would be poured out on the church, the church had to be moved to be with one accord or in harmonious union or in unity of purpose. On one accord in prayer and supplication and in seeking God for clear direction. In fact, someone once said that the blessed dove, referring to the Holy Spirit, will do a flyover, but will not light on a people embroiled in strife. Something very powerful, isn't it? The Holy Spirit essentially, this writer suggests, retreats from disharmony and disunity. Now there are some that will say that the miraculous things that we read in Acts 2 did not or could not literally have happened. I am a person who has seen miracles. See, that's the kind of thing that you say as a Pentecostal and people go, no, I'm just like, mm -mm. But the mere fact that I am woman clergy, same gender loving and standing in this chapel, which wasn't built for me, suggests that miracles are in fact and indeed possible. I am impossible, but I am possible tangible and in this place today, right? Miracles do happen. There are people that want to take the supernatural out of the experience in Acts 2 and 4. I'm all right with it, but I'd like to reframe the supernatural. I'd like to say there are those that say do not believe or things that cannot be believed in all probability did not happen, but I'd like to believe that it did happen. What is the miracle? We who have seen miracles and manifestations in dreams and signs should not be surprised that a miracle did happen. But the true miracle, the one that is most important, is the one that is least observed. None of the things that happen, the tongues and the languages and the fire on their heads, none of that could have happened without the miracle of unity. Unity had to happen first. And it took a few days to work it out. And I suspect that they had some issues of politics. I suspect they had some issues about who's on first. I suspect they had some issues about James and Andrew and them. You all understand what I'm saying, wanting to be at the right hand of Jesus, and what's that about? I suspect they had some issues about the presence of women, classism, the rich and the poor, different languages, different nationalities. Just let your imagination run now and say if somebody locked the doors on this chapel, and said we had to stay in here until we got unified. How long would it take? How many? Come on, how long would it take until we got on one page and had one purpose? Not having essentially the same mind about all things, but minding the same things. How incredible would that be? But it would take some days. It took them some days. Theological education, the bastions of theological education are places for agreement and disagreement. The whole idea is to come here and disagree. Did anybody hear what I said? Did you, see, I heard my professor say so and so, but what I believe, anybody understand what I'm saying? What I have to say about that, that we are encouraged. Imagine if we had to agree in, in and on purpose how long we would have to remain. The miracle was unity, and Jesus was very clear with them. Journey to Jerusalem and wait together. And sometimes I use the metaphor of skin to talk about unity. Skin covers our bodies, the biggest organ we have. It holds everything together. If you don't have it, all your stuff will fall out. You understand what I'm saying? You need your skin, but inside and under your skin, your liver livers and your kidneys kidney and your heart beats. Anybody understand? Your circulatory system can be going that way, but you can walk the whole body that way. Because each thing has its function, functioning well together, but covered by this organ that gives it unity of purpose, right? 
You can make it without some of those organs, but you will not make it without your covering. The thing that holds us together. We need something to hold us together. Let me hurry. Unity is a miracle for religious folks because there's a certain intrinsic evil in our religious history. It is the sin of absolutism. And we suffer it for, from it horribly. If I'm a die-in-the-wool Methodist and you're a die-in-the-wool Presbyterian, come on now, and don't be a die-in-the-wool Pentecostal because we're coming for you. <laughs> we believed everybody was going to hell but us. We were very serious about it too. Trust me, even other Pentecostals were going to hell. So it, it was a certain brand of Pentecostal that we were. What am I saying to you? Essentially, even if I am kind, if I have essentially judgment light, if I'm a dying the wool Methodist, there, there is something somewhat dysfunctional about a Lutheran, somewhat dysfunctional about a Presbyterian. Bless their hearts. I love them with the love of Jesus. But if they could just get that baptism right, you understand, in that order of worship, and if they would just revise their book of order, some, there's something that's wrong. Be why are they wrong? Because I'm right. Embedded in religion is absolutism. I believe that what I believe is the thing to believe. Why do I believe it? Well, perhaps because my mama believed it. She did it like this. My grandmother, and if I had been born, however, in Islamabad, I would likely be a Muslima. I'd be a Muslim woman because my mama was a Muslim and my grandmama was a Muslim and 75% of what we call absolute religion is in fact culture. Let me move on. And so my God, my creed, my baptism, my vision, my experience, my interpretation, my version of the text, my belief system is ordered by my atmosphere. Anybody hear me? As one sister came up to me one day when I was about to preach, she said, so you're the preacher? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, I hope you preach from the real word of God. And I said, what might that be, my sister? She said, why, the King James. I said, and that is the real word of God. She said, yes, written by James, the brother of Jesus, before he became a king. I said, can you tell me that again? <laughs> and someone asked me, why didn't you correct her? I said, oh no, honey. I said, uh-uh. That was a whole year of seminary it would have taken for me to clear all that. She got a pastor. I'm not her pastor. Let her talk to her pastor. That's too many things. But she was absolutely clear such that she wanted me corrected before I went to the pulpit. You understand. First purpose, unity. Second one, quickly. The second purpose, I believe, was to get everybody's attention and for the purpose of God to be outed in the street. The purpose of God is good for the places like this where we learn, but it is not helpful until it is outed. God has to be outed. God, God has got to be on front street. The sights and sounds serve to alert people that an unusual event had occurred and to bring them together to personally witness the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. In the last days, I, God, will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Young men, old men, dreaming dreams, seeing visions. Young women, old women, dreaming dreams, seeing visions. And the transgender shall go forth in the dance. That was a little bit of my part added on to that. And they were beside themselves with amazement. This is what the people said. Aren't all of these who are talking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own particular dialect to which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and inhabitants of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus, provinces in Asia, Provinces in Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, and Serene, and transient residents from Rome, Jews, proselytes from Judaism, and Creeks, and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our languages the mighty works of God. 
The blessing of God has been outed. It has broken out of the cloister and it has come down the stairs and into the marketplace. The sights and sounds of Pentecost brought all of those people together around these incorrectly perceived drunk ministers <laughs> on the stairs or coming down the stairs because no secret movement was intended. Now let me say to you, while we're talking about Black Lives Matter, while we're talking about Gay Lives Matter, while we're talking about Women's Lives Matter, hallelujah, let me say to you, if you're not ready to be public, if you're not ready to put something on Facebook and put your real picture, not an avatar, use your real face, take a real risk, then all of the justice work that we are doing behind closed doors is not helpful to the movement that we are called to. Question is not what will you live for, but what do you believe enough that you will die for? Somebody said, well, I'm not ready to die. There's a lot of ways to die. Not just in terms of the death of your body, but sometimes the death of your future in terms of how you have plotted it out because you want the big church on the corner. Come on with me now. And you want to be politically correct so you can get a politically correct job. But the Holy Ghost, my grandmother would say, is calling you to out yourself as a justice warrior. The Spirit of God is not good for the cloister. The Spirit of God needs people that will take it to the street and pay the price for what it is that we both believe and have received. I know I'm close to overtime, so let me say this. The sights and sounds of Pentecost brought those people to the street. This tells us that the events of Pentecost were meant for worldwide broadcasting and intended for worldwide attention. John 20 suggests that Jesus had given the disciples the blessing privately. You've read it, haven't you? It says that the evening of the resurrection, the same evening, Jesus went to their homes, stood in their midst, and said, Peace be to you. He showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And then Jesus said, Peace be to you. As God has sent me, even so send I you. And then he said this, and then he breathed on them. And he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. That was a private blessing. Hallelujah. I thank God for private blessings. But then he told them, now go to Jerusalem and wait because i got something else for you. I've got something else for you. I've designed it perfectly. I'm going to do it on the day that everybody comes from everywhere. Every land and country in the known world, they'll all be there in the flea market. Come on now. Selling their stuff, their pots and their rugs and their and hair weaves and everything that they have. They'll be there selling it. And I want you to go in the upper room and receive something and come down the stairs because I'm not sending it just for you privately. I'm empowering you to do the work publicly. When the day of Pentecost came, 18 different regions of the world were called together, present at that event. Faces that could be various colors and races and tribes, they were alerted by the sound of a rushing mighty wind attracted by the tongues of fire. But Pentecost was really about getting the known world's attention. God knows how to get God's will on Front Street. Sometimes the greatest trouble in your life, the greatest stigma attached to your life, the greatest problems that occur in your life, they seem like it's some sort of devious evil plan. But in reality, it's to get you out there. Anybody understand me? Not long ago, I was embroiled in a mess, someone would say, where I'd been invited to American Baptist College in Nashville, Tennessee, the bastion of power of the National Baptist Convention. As a woman, but as an out woman, do you understand? And a group of brothers got together and they found themselves a publicist. They paid a lot of money and they had me in every big news venue in the country. And the headline was the same, lesbian bishop legally married to a woman. Big old letters. First of all, I got more work from it. I can't even begin to tell you. 
I'm booked all the way to the end of 17, and I want to thank those brothers. Hallelujah! For opening doors and making ways for me. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord. The other thing I want to say to you is that not one word in the line was wrong. Everything they said was correct. The mistake they made is that they thought that I, like many of my colleagues, have not told my own truth. Because if you tell your own prophetic truth, then there's nobody that can come behind you and say things about you that will destroy your already told and known truth in the world. Every bit of it was the truth. And I turned to Shirley, I said, and bless God's great name, legally married is also something that we can celebrate. And I want to say it to you, sisters and brothers, after 31 years of being with my partner, 31 years, I thought to myself, and you fellas are just finding that out, that's new news? <laughs> and when I got there, and they put out the word that there were going to be thousands of people that were going to turn it out, and they gave me armed guards. I had three armed guards and two guards that weren't armed. I walked in a circle of five men everywhere I went because the fear on the school was that religious people, because they had threatened to come for me. And I'm 5'2", right in the middle of all these guys. That religious people would come for me. But the joy and the peace that surrounded my heart was I said, God, if evidently we have reached a place in life and purpose where you can put us in the lion's den, come on, hear me now, and we will stand forth and we will stand true to what it is you have called us to do. This is the purpose of the Holy Spirit, to empower us to do the work. Because when you get through getting the letter while you are here and Filling, uh, being filled with the Spirit, you're going to have to take it out there. And don't let that atmosphere make you take back the truth that you have absorbed and you have believed while you are here. And then I'll close. Really, I will. Pentecost. The congregation was made up of everybody, the first Pentecostal congregation, made up of everybody available. <laughs> and people received the manifestation that they needed. I will received the Holy Ghost while Mother Virgie Lee Hunter and Mother Jessie Mae Gatson were praying for me. And they prayed for me on the altar, folding chairs down on my knees. They prayed for me and they said, open your mouth, say something. Yes, Lord, call the name of Jesus. Open your mouth, get your mind on Jesus, get your mind on Jesus. Pay attention, get your mind on him, get, let all that other stuff go. Just keep calling on his name, there's power in his name, that's it. just keep on praying. Open your mouth, Yvette. You want to get it? Do you want to receive it? And that's the way they prayed for me. Those girls prayed for me. Now, I don't know what the manifestation of spirit is for you. I believe that all those people that came, they received what they needed in order to believe in their own language, in their own culture, with their own sound. But I believe this. I believe that that is the way the spirit comes. I teach my ushers at my church you got to learn how to handle different kind of shouting. Because my Pentecostals shout the two-step, you know, they, they shout. That's the way they shout. My Baptists fall out. They fall out flat. You understand? I said my Methodists run. Methodists, black Methodists run and they run and they run. And then they run and they run. And then you got to try to keep my Catholics and Episcopal people calm because they don't understand why all of this is happening. So you have to be multicultural, if you understand what I'm saying. Because it comes different. But how about this? In their own language, in their own culture, perhaps the spirit comes in the dance around the holy fire. Or the intimacy of a sweat lodge. Or on the runway in the house and ball culture. Perhaps in the spinning of the whirling dervishes. In the bathing of the waters in the Ganges River. Perhaps God honors the expectations of our culture, but at the same time, same spirit, same anointing, same presence of power to bring us from the cloister and to take the love of God to the street. I'm almost through. 
So here's the question I have for you. Are we willing and ready to be a Pentecostal assembly? Yeah. Union Pentecostal Church. Yeah. Pentecost. And the outpouring and the outworking of the Holy Spirit for a worldwide, out loud broadcasting of God's radical inclusion. And I'm not telling you how you'll know when spirit manifests, but I can promise you, you will know when you are having a spirit manifestation. And so I say to the Holy Spirit, in my own life, no more closets. Break out wherever you want to, under any circumstances, whether it's politically correct or not. Break out when I'm at the White House. Break out when I'm down south, in the places where the statements made about me, intended for an insult, simply tell the testimony of my life. Break out wherever you want to break out with my children, with my small children, with my grown children. Break out among white people, among Asian people, among black people. Just break out any way you want to break out. I'm giving you freedom, Holy Spirit, to come out of the closet of my religion and do what you are calling me to do. What is the blessed result of the Holy Spirit filling the church? Many were blessed. Many were filled. Many began to speak in other languages and in other cultures. They had a cross-cultural revival as the Spirit gave utterance. Take this with you. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to give power to your public witness. Private anointing to give power to your public witness so that when you put your foot down in a place, if you're the only one who has that word, when you leave, people are fundamentally and substantively changed. Power. Power. It's not about private anointing. And neither, by the way, is your training and your study. It was about coming down the stairs, out of the cloister, out of the halls of private religion, into the street, speaking the languages of the people, feeling the vibe of the people, doing the circle dance with the people, taking up the causes of the people, and causing change to happen among the people. The anointing of synergy, of identification, Holy Ghost-filled identification with the other. It was about how God would broaden their reach and deepen their love. And believe it or not, they were given power over division, over disunity, over personal embarrassment in preparation for their call. This is what the blessing came to do. And this is what the blessing still does. And I declare that our God is still the Lord of the Pentecost. God bless you is my prayer. God. We have another task. I'd like to introduce you to the Flunder Singers. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Tragedies are commonplace All kinds of diseases People are slipping away The economy's down And people can't get enough pay As for me All I can say is Thank you Lord for all you've done for me Drug habits, some say they just can't beat. There are 
muggers and robbers No place seemed to be safe But you've been my protection Every step of the way And I want to say thank you, Lord For all you've done for me Yeah, 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 yes It could have been me And yours No food No cold You didn't see fit to let none of these things be. Every day by your power, you keep keeping me. And I want to say, God bless you. I know we're over time. I know we're over time. But this is how we do it at home. We go like this. Thank you, Lord. 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 you say, thank you. That's it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey. Thank you, Lord. Thanks. One more time. Thank you. We have received the Spirit. Let us wrap ourselves in the love and light of this Alleluia moment. Let us go forward and preach in our public voice.
to all proclaim Pentecost. Go forth. Alleluia.